Welcome to Focus on Health, a series of educational programs highlighting current health issues sponsored by the Department of Nursing at Salisbury University. I'm Dr. Mary DiBartolo, Professor of Nursing at Salisbury University and host of the program. I welcome back Dr. James Cockey. You are the Physician Dep Deputy Health Officer from the Wicomico County Health Department. You've been on the program before and with all the um, news and the media about the measles outbreak and so on, we decided to get together again because you would like to talk about the ethical questions surrounding vaccinations. Mm -hmm. Take it away. Well, well this um, became a very interesting topic over the last few months because of the measles outbreak that started in Disneyland. Um, measles, for the most part, has been um, contained in the United States for at least 15 years, so that um, there are cases of measles in the United States over the last 15 years, but they've been about almost all of them cases that were brought in from abroad and did not spread widely. Um, the one in Disneyland was also brought in from abroad. It, was, it seems to have come in from the Philippines. Um, what was new and different in the Disneyland outbreak is it spread from person to person. People who, who were visiting Disneyland caught it and spread to other people at home and school and so forth. Um, and when that was starting up in December and January, and there were new cases every day, there was a worry about the potential for having a huge outbreak for thousands or tens of thousands um, of people. That used to be routine back in the 1950s before the measles um, vaccine was developed and before it became um, routine. Um, it used to be that there would be hundreds of deaths every year in the United States and there's still about 150,000 deaths from measles uh, around the world because of inadequate, inadequate vaccination. Um, in the United States, there has been a movement um, where parents uh, are afraid of vaccinations so that the um, level or the percentage of kids who are vaccinated um, has been dropping over the last couple of years. And the fear was that if there is a critical mass of unvaccinated people, um, that um, measles might spread rapidly and become a, a, an epidemic and um, a major crisis. As it's turned out, there were enough people in the United States who have been vaccinated, and this is related to the principle of herd immunity, um, that the, the Disneyland outbreak has stopped. Um, by compared to recent standards, there are quite a few people. There are about 140 some people in that outbreak, and over 160 just in the first quarter of 2015, which is higher than we've been in recent years. But it, it, it has been contained. And um, one of the big ethical issues that has risen from this um, is um, the right of people to refuse vaccinations for themselves and to refuse it for their children because they have concerns, and the right of society to um, demand public health measures such as immunization to protect other people, particularly people who can't have um, vaccinations for medical reasons. And, and the, what would the, be some examples of that? Leukemia is the one that was in the news quite a bit a few months ago. Um, there was a little boy in California with leukemia um, and the measles vaccine is a live vaccine and it would be dangerous for that child to be injected with, uh, with measles. And his parent, his father was very vocal and was in the news quite a bit and went to his school board um, asking them not to allow children to come to school who had not been vaccinated because it put his son's life at risk. Um, that their Board of Ed did not uh, agree with that at that at time, but it, it, it kind of highlights the um, ethical issues that are at stake. If I don't let my child be vaccinated against measles, it could cause the death of another child. So maybe recap for us, um, you know, what are some of the reasons that people can refuse besides personal preference? Well, are there, I mean, are there it, categories of those reasons that are acceptable or not? There are, and it varies from state to state around the country, and it has um, varied historically since vaccinations were first developed in 1796. And the most of the history I'm familiar with is uh, in England. Um, the, in, the, in the state of Maryland and in every state, if you have a medical uh, contraindication, you don't have to have a vaccination. Like immune, a, a person who has immune suppressive disease, is, um, has cancer, uh, is on chemotherapy, where a live vaccine would be particularly um, dangerous. Um, 
the there are also in Maryland um, allowances for religious um, objections. So if, if there's a in Maryland law they say a bona fide religious obje objection, um, then the the vaccination um, can be waived. Um, some state and these these requirements are only related to school. Uh, these are vaccinations that are required for going into school. Um, aside from school requirements, there are no mandated vaccinations in, in the United States. Some um, some states have allowed, in addition to medical um, waivers and uh, religious waivers, they've allowed philosophical objections. And California um, allows a philosophical objection. Objection. Um, some states don't allow any uh, exemptions from vaccination um, except for medical reasons. And uh, uh, Mississippi is one of those, and they have the highest rate of school age vaccinations in the country. Um, in Maryland, um, our vaccination rates in Wicomico County and for the state for school age kids are very good, um, even with our relatively liberal um, exemption um, uh, laws. Um, and they were good enough so that in this recent outbreak, there were no cases of measles um, in, in Maryland. One of the big um, ethical issues there is if it did get widespread in Maryland, if there are more and more people who refuse vaccination, at what point um, would the schools start refusing um, to let children who weren't vaccinated come to school? At what point would other public uh, places have that policy? At what point would it, there be a con, uh, considered to be a sufficient public health danger that quarantine would be required so that um, the risk of spreading disease would be uh, would be reduced? I know you mentioned the concept of herd immunity earlier. Would you like to expand on that a little bit? Yeah, her, herd immunity is a difficult concept, and and uh, there's a lot of mathematics behind it. Um, but a simple illustration of it, um, going back to the 18th and 19th centuries, is smallpox. Smallpox did not occur every year, or measles didn't occur in great epidemics every year. You'd have an outbreak of smallpox, for instance, and then you'd have a few years that would pass before another one, and when the next one came, the people who had it last time didn't get it. So there's some notion built into just observing the natural history of these diseases that um, if you've been exposed before, you don't get it and you don't pass it on. And that, that observation is the basis for this notion of herd immunity. If you have a whole bunch of people, a high percentage of the population, which is immune to a disease, it's hard to spread it around. And um, the degree of uh, penetration of vaccination you need depends on how infectious the, the, the disease is. Measles is highly infectious, and on average, when you, when you count the numbers on, on large outbreaks, each individual person with um, measles will cause 16 other people in an unimmunized uh, population to get sick. So you can see how it rapidly would spread through the, um, through the whole population. Um, <clears throat> when you have 95% of the population um, immunized, uh, the, a person who is sick is unlikely to um, be exposed to somebody who isn't immunized so that you tend to contain um, the outbreak. Unfortunately, that's what happened with the, with the Disneyland outbreak. Yeah, that's good news that that seems to be behind us now. But why are people afraid to get this vaccine? Um, you know, ever since um, vaccinations were developed in 1796, there has been a large part of the population that uh, has been afraid of them and rejected it. And in the early days of vaccination, um, that, that was acceptable. Um, as vaccines got better and more effective, it um, came to be seen as a um, right of the public to protect itself and protect its vulnerable people <clears throat> against these diseases. So um, that some vaccinations, particularly smallpox early on, uh, became mandatory. And I think part of it is that people don't like to be told what to do. Uh, there's a, a, a resistance to that. And to some extent, that's built into the Constitution of the United States. Um, to some extent, people are afraid of foreign substances um, being uh, put into their bodies. Um, to some extent, um, there's a mistrust of um, big organizations like the United States, like the government telling you what to do, a mistrust 
of very large, very wealthy corporations um, um, <clears throat> making uh, money off of these things and people not trusting that they're um, safe. <clears throat> and I think those, um, those concerns are out there and, and always have been since the vaccinations have been around. Unfortunately, in the last couple of decades, there have um, been some manipulative, um, uh, falsified research, as well as manipulative uh, public relation, public relations um, campaigns that have made it worse. And the most notorious one is um, the falsified research by Dr. Andrew Wakefield, uh, an English physician who um, had a study published in The Lancet in 1998, which is a very distinguished, worldwide recognized um, medical journal, um, with suggestions that the trivalent measles, mumps, rubella vaccination was associated with autism. And immediately in England and then in, in the United States and the rest of the world, um, parents were afraid uh, to give the MMR. And um, subsequent studies were done exhaustively. No association whatsoever has been found between the MMR um, <clears throat> vaccination and autism. And when people started being afraid to do it, of course, um, measles rates went up in the places um, that um, where the uh, vaccination um, had been declined. So Dr. Wakefield, eventually um, there were major exposés of him receiving hundreds of thousands of dollars from trial lawyers and him making money off of this and falsifying his data. But um, the damage was out there. He, he is not allowed to practice medicine in England. He lost his license there. He lost his license in the United States. Um, but his legacy lives on. There are people who cling uh, to that early, um, to that 1998 um, paper as a justification, I think, for their psychological fears. And there's, there's other things that have been out there with celebrities, with um, uh, TV reporting, suggesting um, associations between vaccinations and, and you know, horribly suffering um, people, when those have been studied under um, a scientific approach, they don't hold up. And part of the issue there is that um, people, including children, can have horrible things happen. Their children can die in their sleep. Children can have seizures. And if you have a vaccine uh, within a couple of weeks of that, people think cause and effect. Um, and you have to do very large population studies to be able to find out what the basic rate is without the vaccine and whether the vaccine is associated with higher rates of, um, of these problems. Well, I know that Wakefield study was a very small sample to begin with, but as we know, it's very hard to undo something when it first comes yeah, it, out. And, it lives, and it's, and I, I get into conversations with people who frequently who express concern about the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine causing autism, which is well established in the scientific literature to not be the case, but it's still out there and, and some parents struggle with that as um, in questioning whether or not to vaccinate their children. I know I've chatted with some physicians about the very thing and it's, it's like people will still cling on to that until we find out what exactly does cause autism, which may or may not happen. It seems and complicated. I think there is a degree of research that is elucidating that, and but the people who are anti-vaccination um, seem very focused on, on vaccination as being the cause. And a big part of that also was that the, um, the trial lawyer um, lobby um, very much promoted um, lawsuits, that, and it was quite lucrative for a while in the billions of dollars. Uh, to the point where vaccine manufacturer, manufacturers um, had lost some money on it, they were quitting, stopping making vaccinations. And that was recognized as a national health crisis. And because of that, under President Reagan, um, the national vaccine, um, I forget, national vaccine um, compensation program or something like that, was um, passed um, and um, that created vaccine courts and um, gave some degree of immunity to the uh, companies so that they would get back into making vaccinations, which are recognized on a governmental level and on a scientific level and medical level uh, have been, as having been incredible uh, benefits to mankind in preventing some diseases which, which can be horrific. Part of the issue also with the vaccine refusals is that um, People don't see large numbers of kids who are damaged by polio, by measles, by smallpox, 
um, it's felt that those are far away and um, can't happen to us, and which is probably true with smallpox, but it's certainly not true with measles and with, um, with polio. Um, and um, there seems to be a tendency when a vaccine is first developed as there's very wide acceptance and embracing and everybody wants it. And you have a couple of decades where those diseases largely disappear and then people don't want it anymore and they start feeling that maybe the potential complications of the vaccine are worse than the disease. And then the disease comes back and the um, vaccine is re-embraced. It's like a re-education all over again yeah. by unfortunate experiences. So what role does society or government have in protecting vulnerable populations? And that has, that has been a struggle in the United States for over 100 years and in England for um, longer than that. Um, the, and this has several times gone to the Supreme Court. <clears throat> and the, um, the people who uh, have taken it to court and wanted to refuse um, vaccinations. There are two constitutional amendments that it's based on. One of them is the due process uh, clause of the uh, 14th Amendment, and the other one is the establishment of religion clause uh, in, in the First Amendment. So some people have argued in court that it's a religious violation if their religion claims um, that they are against uh, vaccines, and other people claim uh, that on the 14th Amendment, uh, it's too much of uh, an infringement on personal liberty. And in both those areas, the Supreme Court um, has come down on side of legislation or public health, um, uh, taking the position that, the, um, that school boards, municipalities, states, national government have the right to protect the health um, in a rational manner. They don't try to, the courts have not tried, aside from the vaccine injury courts, um, have not tried to uh, determine what a rational policy is, but if the legislature um, has uh, attempted a, a, a what they think is a rational policy, the courts uh, have not intervened with it. At the same time, there is no um, ruling or law that actually requires a vaccination. It has never happened in the United States that someone has been given a vaccination against their will, has been tied down, has been um, forcibly um, required to have a vaccination. The laws that exist about vaccination require them to go to school. That's the one that we most commonly uh, deal with in Maryland. Um, to get into kindergarten or first grade um, or the seventh grade, there are certain vaccinations that are required. If you d and the law does not require you to get those vaccinations, but you can't go to school unless you've had them. Um, some of the early vaccinations in England, the law did not force the vaccination for smallpox, but there were financial fines if you didn't get the vaccination for uh, smallpox. And because uh, of those concerns about due process, um, every state in the country allows um, for some degree of waivers or exemptions from the required um, vaccinations, some of them for medical reasons only, some for religious objections, some for um, philosophical uh, objections. And the, um, the degree of sort of laxity of giving the exemptions um, does affect how many kids do get vaccinated. And there, there is debate with the recent measles um, outbreak as to whether those um, laws should be tightened up so that um, we don't get into a situation where a low proportion of, of the population is vaccinated, is not vaccinated. There are communities in California and, and Washington where the rate of MMR vaccination is as low as 80% in kids. Um, and if you get one child with measles in there, you're gonna have a terrible outbreak. Fortunately, that didn't happen on this recent outbreak. So do you see something positive coming from this that more states might well, go down I, that road of I don't know that that's positive. Um, I think that the the more you force people to do something, the more resistance there's going to be. I think the the positive um, societal response that comes out of the um, um, the measles outbreak and the fear that it could spread and, and get much much worse is that more people are conscious that. The vaccination helps, it makes a difference. Um, these diseases are not gone. Um, it's a good thing that legislators are aware of that. It's also a good thing that parents are aware of that. 
and vaccine rates, where it's been measured in some parts of the country, have taken a significant, about a 30% increase over the same time um, a year ago um, in response to the uh, MMR. So I think societal awareness, some degree of legislative um, awareness um, has been beneficial. I do not want to see a situation where government does <laughs> forcibly um, push needles into people's arms. I, I don't think that would be a good idea. So then what's a person to do? Is it, is it an intelligent decision? Is it a moral decision? What's your uh, thoughts I think on it, that? I think it's both. There's no question um, if, if you accept the, the data that's out there with the experts in the field, that your child is better off um, getting the, the standard um, recommended regimen of, of vaccinations. Um, there are people um, who are against vaccinations, who disagree with that analysis, who don't trust the, um, the medical journals, don't trust uh, academic medicine. And that, that's a basic difference of opinion. And I, uh, I think the, the, the scientific medical uh, work is trustworthy, but um, that's not going to convince some people. So um, on a, a judgment level, intellectual level, yeah, I think it makes sense. On a moral level, I think um, it is hard to defend not vaccinating your child. Um, there are children who have diseases like cancer, like leukemia, um, who can't get it uh, because of the, um, their immune system isn't able to handle this. And if your child transmits it to their child and that child dies, um, I think that the parent of the first child is more morally responsible. So I, I do think that there is a strong moral imperative um, to get as many people as possible vaccinated over these very readily um, transmitted diseases to protect the vulnerable in our society. Is there a target vaccination rate, you know, nationwide that we'd like to see happen given that some people it, can't get it and some people won't get it? And that varies according to the disease. There are some diseases that are highly infectious, like measles, where you need a high proportion of the, of the population to be immune to so not spread it. And that is thought to be somewhere around 93, 95 percent of the population um, for measles. Um, there are um, other diseases where a lower proportion of the population, because the disease is less infectious, um, uh, would need to be vaccinated. In mumps, it's probably in the 80s. Um, the, there is a notion that influenza um, has vaccination has a degree of herd immunity. This past season, 2014-15, it wasn't there. Um, the influenza vaccine that we were giving starting in late August turned out that the, it would, didn't match well with the, vac, with the strain of influenza going through the um, population. So there was minimal protection and there was no herd immunity from the vaccination. Most years there is, um, but uh, this past year there wasn't. Yeah, that's what worries me, that one off year you know, might dissuade people in the future because most people know and agree that it's a good idea to get the flu vaccine it, for most well, people. That, that's true, and it's also true that um, to have a credible public health um, effort to encourage vaccines, you have to be very clearly honest about all the data coming in, even if it doesn't support your position. You also want to be very clear um, not to promote false data um, that goes uh, in the direction of um, making your, the vaccine uh, appear worse than it is. You need scrupulously um, honest, open, transparent scientific work. I think that's out there now and have been for many years. Obviously, there's some people th that disagree with that. Well, thank you so much for all your insights on this very important topic and certainly intriguing to talk about the ethical issues involved in this. But, um, you know, in general, I imagine the health department, what is their role exactly with well, immunizations? Our, our role, um, we don't have any role in the ethical controversy um, around this. Um, many pediatricians do, and some pediatricians' role in that is to refuse to accept uh, children in their office who haven't been vaccinated and the rationale for that is that those children when they get sick will infect other people um, in their waiting room. Waiting room yeah. So there are ethical, ethical, ethical issues just um, on the pediatric pediatrician level 
as to whether or not it's morally acceptable to expose um, at-risk people to people who could have avoided a disease. But in the health department, we promote the, uh, the vaccinations which are required, um, which are suggested. Uh, we make them available to people. We work with um, the Board of Education to make sure we have extra clinics and we, uh, to make sure that kids going into kindergarten and first grade and into seventh grade get the, uh, the uh, department, Maryland Department of Education mandated uh, vaccines. Um, we work and, and try to facilitate um, um, people's ability to comply with, with the law and to get vaccines that they want. Well, thank you for clarifying that. We know the health department is very important in our community, but it, it's nice to get an angle on exactly what your role is. And as always, thank you again for your insights and explanation. It's always a pleasure, Mary. And thank you for joining us for this edition of Focus on Health here on PAC 14. Mm -hmm.